All right, so this is Act 2 of Hero Journey in The Graduate, and this is going to cover the stage of Descent and Initiation, which is the four Vogler stages of Test Allies and Enemies, Approach to the Inmost Cave, the Ordeal, and the Reward. This section of the film, of course, starts with two songs. It replays the sound of silence. And if I went back to stage one, one of the things that you have to start with with a hero journey is the idea of the internal lack versus the external lack. Um, probably in your head, think about really quickly what you think each one of those are. And if you want to pause, then you can get a clear picture in your head before I ruin it for you. But for Benjamin, the external lack is probably a sense of uh, purpose. He's graduated from college and has no idea what he wants to do so he just kind of drifts around um, and he's kind of aimless. His internal lack probably has to deal with a sense of the power and the control, especially power in regards to control that I talked about in the first screencast. Benjamin not only lacks the external issue of doesn't have purpose, but that's part of his internal issue of he doesn't really feel like he's in, in control of anything. And so he's desperately seeking for status, who he wants to be and where he wants to be. Act two kind of reminds us through these two songs that he's actually, although he started his quest, he's gone into this special world. Not really much has changed. He still hears the sound of silence. There's still this sense of discord. He still feels like he doesn't really have purpose. And then they also pl play the song, April Come She Will, which if you go to the months, the idea of July she'll fly and give no warning of her flight, um, June she'll change her tune. And that's probably playing into the idea of this affair that he's having with Mrs. Robinson isn't particularly satisfying. And so these two songs tell me that although Benjamin has crossed the threshold, it's not, he's not really going anywhere just yet. You can see this in the beginning. The special world is this kind of going back and forth between the hotel and the affair with Mrs. Robinson and being at home. And he already does seem more masculine. When I took this, when I took film in high school, my film teacher talked about the strategic placement of the beer can and all of these subsequent scenes that make him look like he's, make it look kind of like a phallic symbol. And he does seem to be showing off his masculinity. He's struts around a little bit more. He's um, usually has a shirt off. He's sunbathing. Um, he's interacting with Mrs. Robinson. So the special world is marked by a heightened sense of sexuality, but he always still has that same blank, unhappy look on his face. The next section is this test allies and enemies. And the one thing I want to make really, really clear, so please note this somewhat, somewhere in your notes. This stage can take a very, very long time. If you think about the Wizard of Oz, this stage of test allies and enemies lasts from the moment Dorothy lands on Oz up until the moment that she gets to uh, the Emerald Palace. So think about what a very, very long, long segment of the film that is. Because the hero is going to be tested often and face several, several tests. You're going to come across lots of different allies, but there's usually just one enemy. Skipping ahead, there's Elaine who's going to surface as an ally. And I put her picture above Mrs. Robinson because there's a very important connection between them besides being mother and daughter. His parents, in some respects, should be allies, but they seem to be kind of a thing that causes him to change in a negative way because he's responding against them. He doesn't really want to be like his parents. Mrs. Robinson is tricky. I established earlier that she's going to be the mentor, but also suggested that she may turn into a dark mentor. She seems to be his ally, but she also kind of pushes his buttons and insults him quite a bit. Uh, and there's a strong way that she's even set up early on as being a shadow. She's always put in, in leopard prints and animal prints. She's put in dark col colors, and she seems to be somewhat predatory. So there's a good chance that she's going to be 
the shadow. The rule of shadow is it's something that's like the hero, but that ultimately, through polarity, they are actually exact opposites. And Benjamin and Mrs. Robinson's are really exact opposites. He thinks he might want to be like her, but ultimately he's going to have to reject her, and I'll show you how that happens in a minute. Truth be told, Benjamin probably is also one of his own enemies that he seems to kind of like get in his own way. He is actually surprisingly alone. He doesn't really seem to have any friends until Elaine comes along. And so there's a way in which it does seem to be about him and the kind of forces he exerts against himself. All right, so let me talk about the many, many tests Benjamin goes through before he has to get to the ultimate ordeal. One test is that talk versus sex scene where Benjamin tries to talk with Mrs. Robinson and she talks about her art history degree, about how Elaine was conceived. And ultimately, though, by the end, Benjamin tries to leave because he realizes that she kind of dis almost hates him. And so Benjamin realizes that this isn't a relationship maybe in the way that he wants. It's really just about using each other and it makes the scene becomes this reminder that he's engaged with a kind of a tawdry affair that's really not that meaningful. And so he tries to leave. He's about to leave. He's dressed. He's near the door. And then Mrs. Mrs. Robinson starts putting on her stockings and she shows her legs once again which is a nice harken back to that initial seduction. And he stays and he has sex with her even though he realizes that neither of them like each other very much. So that's his first big test that he fails. His second test is about <laughs> Benjamin and his parents. His parents really want um, Benjamin to go hang out with Elaine because they want Benjamin to marry Elaine. And this is another time he fails because he can't stand up to his parents and so he ends up asking Elaine. And this really brings us to the big, one of the bigger tests in which Mrs. Robinson has made it clear that Benjamin is not allowed to date Elaine. And so Benjamin takes her out on this date that is kind of the date from hell because he's driving too fast, he's a real jerk to her, he's got his sunglasses on, like they look exactly like Mrs. Robinson's sunglasses. And you can very distinctly see he's trying to be like Mrs. Robinson, he's trying to be cold and he's trying to be um, kind of mean and he's trying to really assert his power over Elaine. And so he even takes her to the strip club and it's dark and it's seedy. Um, and at that point when he, Benjamin sees her crying he realizes he can't be Mrs. Robinson. So this is the moment I see him reject the mentor. And this is when she begins to emerge as a dark mentor and the shadow. Because by dating Elaine and choosing Elaine, he's going to make Mrs. Robinson um, the villain. And so in actually choosing Elaine and actually being kind to her and establishing a relationship, he gets a friend um, and he gets a chance to relate to somebody and she seems to see him for what he is very clearly. So then you get to the approach to the inmost cave and this is when you start to see Benjamin realizing he's got to end this affair. Uh, Lane figures out when Benjamin takes her to the Taft Hotel that Benjamin's kind of in this tawdry affair and Elaine correctly deduces that it's with a married woman. And so Benjamin realizes that he's got to end this affair. And he shows up the next day to pick up Elaine. And you get a sense of it's all going to be clean and bright. But notice it's raining. It's a big, beautiful, rainy day. And remember, water is about rebirth and baptism and cleansing. And there's a great parallel shot between the two that I picked where Benjamin's in the car with Elaine. And then when he goes to pick up Elaine, Miss Robinson jumps in the car. And it's a great showdown moment where she calls his bluff. She t says that if he continues this affair, that she's going to tell everything about the affair they've been having. And she thinks that's going to be enough to make Benjamin go away. And so she ultimately sets up the ordeal. Before I talk about the ordeal, I'll mention that the Benjamin, uh, not Benjamin, the Mrs. Robinson Elaine dynamic is pretty complicated, um, and it's also about polarities. They are like each other. They're mother and daughter. They both are very attractive. Um, they both have, when, especially when Mrs. Robinson was young, had all this potential. But you get a sense of Miss Robinson got pregnant early 
And so then had to get married, and you get a sense of her life, then went downhill, and she became mean and alcoholic. And so when Benjamin's seeking out Elaine, it's a real threat to Mrs. Robinson. If you remember, this shot happened during Mrs. Robinson's first seduction scene, where she shows up naked in front of Benjamin. And that happens in Elaine's room, and you actually can even see Mrs. Robinson's reflection in Elaine's portrait. So definitely there's a sense of... Miss Robinson wants better things for Elaine than Benjamin. But there's also a way that Mrs. Robinson kind of wants the stable um, kind of future for Elaine that she doesn't think Benjamin can give her. So there's definitely that idea of jealousy and competition and protectiveness. And all those things are really going on between Elaine and her mother, which makes it a really dynamic relationship. Uh, maybe not for the best, but it's dynamic. So then there's the ordeal. Uh, there's a way in which Mrs. Robinson sets up the challenge. Benjamin leaves the car um, and just runs into the house and is trying to pull Elaine away. And he s begins to tell her, but it's really important, and I'll switch to the next slide, that he doesn't actually tell her. He doesn't say, Elaine, by the way, I've been sleeping with your mother. Instead, he sets it up he looks through the door at Mrs. Robinson, and then you get to see how the focus, she, Lane's all blurry, and then as she realizes that it's her mother that Benjamin had the affair with, she becomes in focus. And so, again, I'm going to hit the point that Benjamin doesn't tell Elaine. So, the first debate you get to have is this moment of crisis. The ordeal is the crisis. It's the end of the second act. It's the first time the hero tries to battle the shadow. Um, ostensibly, Benjamin does get to stand up to Mrs. Robinson. And, so let me move this one second. Um, and, he somewhat, oops. <laughs> he actually wins even though he doesn't tell Elaine he at least tried to make the effort um, but she of course rejects him anyway and he defeats Mrs. Robinson and she's backed into a corner look how frail she looks at this moment and you just get the sense of like he does defeat the shadow um, however you could argue that he didn't really win the ordeal because he wasn't the one that says something. And I'm going to pull back this other picture of that moment of Mrs. Robinson in the corner. It looks exactly like the moment at the end of it, and near um, the end of the birthday sequence when Benjamin is underwater in a suit backed into a corner. So I think he acknowledges that feeling of her, a feeling like you've become powerless. Um, but there's a great way in which Benjamin has stepped up. He has tried something. He has fought the shadow and he somewhat wins. But you could also argue that he doesn't exactly win because he didn't tell Elaine. Elaine figured it out for himself. So this is the end of Act 2 and the end of the uh, second set of the Hero Journey stages. So I'm going to stop this one and then I'll come back and tell you about the last act.